Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first uh, family version of Art to Science Online this summer. Um, as most of you know, we're not allowed to have the, the camp in person, so we're live streaming activities to you three times a week. Uh, Saturdays are going to be for families, so all ages can participate. Uh, Monday afternoons are aimed at the younger children, but older children and adults will also enjoy some of the activities. Um, Thursday afternoons are aimed at older kids, young adults, old adults, anybody who wants to play along. Uh, so today we have a very special activity. Uh, we've got a couple of people from the Snipes Museum of Art who are going to be uh, leading you through an activity and I'm going to let them go ahead and introduce themselves. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Kilburn. Welcome families. My name is Sarah. I'm Alex. And we both work at the Snipe Museum of Art, but we are actually in the Charles B. Hayes Family Sculpture Park this morning. So what I'm going to have Alex do, she's going to step off. I'm going to take my mask off so you can hear me a little bit better. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the park. The park is on the southernmost side of campus along Eddy Street. Um, it's between the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center and the Compton Family Ice Arena. Um, in 2017, we reinstalled the park with 10 sculptures. Um, including the one we're going to be talking about today, which is entitled Two Lines Oblique by George Rickey. Um, tell you a little bit about the park. It's nine and a half acres, um, so it's fairly large. Um, and it includes a lot of different things. There are, like I said, 10 sculptures. There are paved paths that go throughout the park, which are great for people who are using strollers or wheelchairs. Um, there's a nice green grassy lawn, which is perfect for picnics or just lounging around in the great weather. Um, there are dog uh, uh, waste stations throughout the park, so we welcome your four-legged friends. Um, and finally, there are plenty of places to sit and rest throughout the park and really enjoy the different views um, and the different vistas. The park is a um, recreation of a native prairie, so you're gonna see lots of grasses and wildflowers native to Indiana. So it's a really nice environment um, to spend time in any time of the day. It's open 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So you can come when it's convenient for you, stay as long as you like. The park is really well lit at night as well. So that's a totally different environment. Maybe come out and do some stargazing um, or check out some animals that come out uh, at night. All right, so the sculpture we're gonna be focusing on today, Miss Alex, if you can shoot the camera up to the sculpture for me. is this one by George Rickey. Um, it is entitled Two Lines Oblique. Um, we'll take a few seconds just to get a look at that. Um, and then I want to show you a picture of George Rickey. He um, spent some time in South Bend, um, so we claim him as one of our own. He was born in 1907, so if he were alive today, he'd be 113 years old. This is a great picture of George Rickey right there. Um, he's best known for his sculptures. You can see hundreds of them at the Snipe Museum of Art. We own his, um, or we maintain his sculpture archive. Um, and you can also see them around the city. There are a couple in downtown South Bend. You can check out one on the Century Center and one across from Chicory Cafe in the downtown area. Ricky was actually trained as a painter. Um, and before he started pursuing his interests, um, in mechanics and engineering through his sculptures. I'm gonna get back to the sculpture really quickly right there. Um, so the sculpture we're focusing on today is two lines oblique. Ricky made sculptures that would fit on your tabletop and then giant sculptures that are only available to view outside like two lines oblique. They all have something in common though. And it's a very important thing. And that is that they are kinetic. And when I say kinetic, I mean, they move. Kinetic means movement. So these are kinetic sculptures, sculptures that move. Ricky was fascinated by motion, especially the motions and the movements he saw in nature, in the natural world. Things like rolling waves, tall grasses swaying, which you can see a lot of those here in the park, um, and leaves spiraling to the ground. All of these movements, are caused by wind, which is a force we can't see. It's invisible. Ricky was interested in playing with the wind and making it visible. And he did this by creating sculptures that moved with the slightest gusts of wind or movements of air. 
I want now to take a few seconds um, just to watch this sculpture move so you can get a sense of how it's moving, the speed and all of that. So let's just take a few quiet moments to watch the sculpture. So one of the most amazing things about Ricky's sculptures is that no matter how long you look at them, you're never going to see them move in the same way twice. They're like a million different sculptures in one. So now that we've spent some time watching this sculpture move, I wanna challenge you to come up with a word to describe the movement that you're seeing, okay? So take a few seconds, talk with your family, come up with a word to de describe the movement you see in this sculpture, okay? So have a little discussion now, and then we're gonna share with you a list of words that people have used to describe the movement and the motions in George Rickey's sculptures. So we have words like slow, graceful, elegant, smooth, spiraling, and controlled. So I wanna ask you, did you come up with a word that's not on our list? And if you did, if you wanna share it with us, we'd really love to add that to our list for future conversations. All right, so we have, um, remember that Ricky wanted to show us what the wind look like because we can feel it right we can feel it on our skin it moves our hair and our clothes but we can't see it so in order to show us what the wind looks like ricky used all the things that he knew about gravity and force and movement to balance his sculptures very precisely so that even the slightest breeze would move a sculpture that weighed hundreds of pounds so the question then is how did he do this and so Alex has some things to show you that will tell us a little bit more about how Ricky made this kind of movement happen. All right. Give me a second here to unmask for all y'all. All right. So I have got a model that George Ricky made for us to teach with. And this is called a blade. And this blade is very much like the blades that are hanging around in front of us. So I'm gonna bring this a little bit closer so you can see. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong camera. So this is a blade model. Now, there's some pretty cool things going on with Ricky's blade model. Some things to notice. This isn't solid. You might think looking at this that it's one solid piece of metal, but I'm gonna turn it around and show you. It's actually hollow. It's bent like you would bend a piece of paper. But also, when you go, keep going all the way to the bottom, it is weighted. So there's a solid core right here, and then the whole rest of it is hollow. And what happens, because Ricky put all the weight on this side over here, it means that it won't balance directly in the center. So on a lot of things, when you balance them, you can put them right in the middle and they'll stay perfectly straight. But because this side is weighted, it falls to one side. So what Ricky did to make this balance, the same way that he made sure that his blade in the two, um, two lines of leaf, stand is he moved the fulcrum point. Now the fulcrum is the point where something balances. So on a regular thing, maybe the balance point would be in the middle, that's the fulcrum. The fulcrum on this, because it's been weighted, is shifted all the way to the edge. I'm gonna show you how it looks on this face that he gave us. So it snaps on and see how it's perfectly straight? That wouldn't happen if we had put the fulcrum in the middle. This whole side would just fall off the table. Now it's going to move carefully and gently just like the big sculptures do and it's going to do it very precisely because he uses what's called a knife edge bearing. So instead of putting it on a tube which would let it spin around in circles all crazy, this will never move a hundred and 360 degrees. It might go almost 180 degrees, but it'll always come back because it's designed very intentional. 
Now, Ricky also used very specific shapes to make his sculptures. And we're gonna show you what those look like. So he used sculptures that were geometric, or shapes that were geometric. They always look the same. They're regular, they have names. So in the example we're showing you, you're gonna see a square, a circle, a triangle, and a star. We know the names for those, those always look the same. He didn't use things like organic shapes, which are underneath. So you might recognize a leaf, but not all leaves look the same. You might see there's some blobby shapes, maybe a cloud, but clouds don't all look the same. So George Wiki intentionally used geometric shapes um, because they're straight and they're regular, which means when they move, they're always going to be consistent. And organic shapes are things you find in nature. So if he was making a sculpture of a tree to show balance, he would use organic shapes. But Ricky didn't do that. He was very intentional and very scientific. So he wanted regular things like geometric shapes. He also did something pretty cool. He added texture to his sculptures. And he did this because he wanted you to be able to see the light bouncing off of it. So even if it's dark out, you can still see the wind moving outside. And he did that by taking a piece of metal and taking a big round sander like this, it's pretty thick, and rubbing it all over. And when you rub it all over, you get a surface like this that kind of is reflective. Let me bring that a little closer. Can you see that texture a little bit? It changes when it moves, as opposed to something flat where you kind of get the same amount of light bouncing at you every time. So we've talked about the things that make George Ricky's sculptures, right? We talked about the fulcrum points and where he put them, the texture and the shapes that he used to make sure that he can show us how things balance and how things move in a controlled way. But now I want to challenge you. We're going to do some balance challenges. Now, we're going to start with our own body because it's the easiest thing. We've all got a body, right? Yeah. So here's how this works. You, I'm going to come here. I want you to stand on one leg. One leg. All right. So you're all standing on one leg. Are you perfectly still? Or some of you guys, like, maybe you're wiggling. Maybe it helps to put your arms out to keep yourself a little bit more still. And that's totally fine. You can all put your arms and your legs down. If you want to up your challenge to really see how it takes to balance something, stand on one leg and hold something heavy in one hand, like a big water bottle, or uh, maybe in one hand hold a water bottle and the other hand hold a stuffed animal. Which arm starts to go down? So your body, in order to stay balanced, you're going to tip more and you're going to move just like our model is here. So now that you've spent some time playing with balance, shifting your body, feeling how it moves, you're still staying upright, but you're balanced, even though you're a little bit wiggly. Let's play with something else. We've got special things in the museum called balance sticks. So here's what those look like. It's a stick. Ours have beads. The beads are all different shapes and sizes. And what we do with these is we challenge people to make it balance on one finger. So my fulcrum point's right in the middle. But there are some other ways it could balance. You could move your fulcrum point by moving all the weight towards one side. I don't know if I can do it today. It's a challenge, it's part of the fun. Watch you alone, this is good with a teammate. Oh, nope. See, so you balance and adjust the beads on your fulcrum. So you can make these at home. You don't need anything really special to do it. Miss Sarah made some for us out of Legos. She did this really cool thing where she put a whole bunch of Lego rings on it to slide around. But what you could also do is you could just put bigger Legos on one side and less Legos on the other side or smaller ones and just move your finger along that till you find the spot where it balances. You can even make balance sticks out of pens or pencils. Just see where in your hand it will balance and here, we have a stick. So maybe you have a stick that's thicker on one end. You're going to have to move your finger closer to that fulcrum point. If you've got a stick, maybe you can put a, a bunch of leaves on one side or put some glue on one side and see where that goes. See how this side's longer than this side? Balance is a really interesting thing, and you can do it without it having to be perfect and staying completely still, just like George Ricky's sculptures. 
So I think now, Miss Sarah, are you ready yes. for your next session? So now you all have a chance to make your own kinetic sculpture out of paper. We don't have stainless steel. We're not going to give you big sanding discs and lead and welding tools and things like that. But there's a really easy way to make a kinetic sculpture at home with paper. So here's what you're going to need. Paper. It could be construction paper, so it could be colored. It could be printer paper. It could be recycled mail uh, would even work for this. You will also need scissors. And in my other pocket, I have a stapler or tape would work as well. Um, and also a piece of string or yarn or a pipe cleaner. Anything really would work for this. Thread would work as well. So what we're gonna do is the very first thing we have to do is we have to turn this rectangle into a square, a very perfect square. And instead of using a ruler and, and measuring and making points and things like that, I have a really easy way to help you do that. So you're gonna take one corner of your paper and you're going to pull it until the sides line up like this. And then you're gonna crease it all the way down. So you've essentially turned your rectangle, um, you've made kind of a little triangle with it. Now you've got this extra flapping thing here and what you're gonna do is you're gonna cut that off. What I love about making squares like this is this is the perfect size for a bookmark. So you have a future project waiting right here, okay? So you have bookmark in the future. So now you have, when you open this up, a perfect square, which is what we need for this kinetic sculpture. The next thing you do with your perfect square after you've opened it up is you're gonna fold it in half, all right? So you're gonna get a nice tall rectangle when you do this. Okay, so you should have a rectangle like this. So you have the folded side here and you have the open side here. I'm gonna turn it so it's like this. So my folded side is here and my open side is here. This is when the scissors come in handy. I'm gonna come in about an inch from my edge and I'm gonna make a cut. Now I'm not gonna cut all the way through my paper because then I'd have another really long skinny rectangle. I'm gonna stop about inch, inch and a half from the edge. You can make it vary depending on the size of your paper. So this is my first cut. I'm gonna go over and I'm gonna make a second cut. And I'm gonna keep doing this all the way across my paper until I get to the other side. Keep going, keep going. Okay, so now I have a really cool kind of flappy sliced up piece of paper, right? So this is sort of kinetic if I move it like this, but it's really not interesting or stable. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put it like this so my cuts run horizontally across the paper. I'm gonna put one hand at this corner and one hand at the bottom corner. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring those corners together. I'm gonna to have them meet. So you get kind of like a, a tube almost. And where those two corners meet, that's where I wanna staple or tape my paper together. Is Sarah, no, do those overlap? They do overlap. Thank you, Miss Alex. There's a slight overlap there. And of course my stapler is broken at this moment. Let me fix this on the fly, maybe. Ooh, okay, maybe. Here we go. No staple, oh, stapler, no staple, no staple. Okay, in any case, you staple your edges together like this. What you're gonna do next is you're gonna poke a small hole in the top corner, the one that's not attaching to each other, and you're gonna attach your string to that top corner. So what we end up with is what Miss Alex is showing you. There's the staple part, there's the hole, and there's the entire kinetic sculpture. And as you move it, Miss Alex, if you move your arm back and forth, it's kind of spiraling. I have another two here to show you. One, so you can play with how you cut your paper. And for this one, you can see I made lots of tiny cuts. It almost looks like pasta noodles. Um, but that creates a different surface for the wind to catch. And so it will spin differently than the one with the larger cuts in it, okay? So another option you have is if you're using white paper and you want to draw a design on it or add some color to your paper, you wanna do that before you make your cuts. So after you turn your paper into a square, that's the time you wanna draw your pattern or your design on it then fold it in half and cut it. And so for this one, I drew some vines and some flowers, a bee and a butterfly. So I made a little nature kind of kinetic sculpture here. 
So you can hang these kind of on your porch. You obviously don't want to leave them outside in the rain or the water, um, but they're really wonderful to work inside in front of a fan or any air currents you have moving through your house as well. So Dr. Kilburn, does anybody have any questions for us? I do not see any, but I'll give people a second. Uh, the okay. YouTube video is about 30 seconds delayed. I think I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Okay, that's fine. I'll give just a little bit of time. So I'll ask a question. What is your favorite George Rickey sculpture? Ooh, that's a challenge. So we have a lot of sculptures inside the museum. They're on the walls and kind of um, in cases. But I actually, this is probably my favorite George Rickey sculpture because it's outside. Um, and so you get to appreciate nature, you spend time outside with it. Um, and then it really behaves differently depending on how windy it is or how calm it is. The great thing about George Rickey sculptures outside is even when it isn't windy, like even when you don't feel the breeze and your hair and your clothes aren't blowing, the George Rickey sculptures are moving because he has engineered them in a way that catches every little bit of movement of air. Um, so I really love the outside ones, this one in particular. How about you, Alex, what's your favorite? So I really like our maquettes. So maquettes are models. They're small sculptures that are used as a test for a big one. And our maquettes, they're very delicate because they're so much smaller. They're not super sturdy like this guy up here. So. The maquettes in the museum are in cases, but it's fun to imagine how they would move because some of them are a bunch of squares stacked together and the squares would all rotate and then the whole thing would move. Um, there's one that's a, a hang from the ceiling. Mobile. A mobile. See, I forget the word I use all the time. <laughs> it's a mobile, it hangs from the ceiling and all the little pieces of that mobile would move in different ways but they also wouldn't over tilt or overbalance the sculpture because of where he's put them. So it's really interesting to see the small ones to kind of get an idea for how his brain was working. So maquettes are like a sketch. They're the beginning stages. So I like seeing how, how his sculptures changed over time. Cool. And is the museum open these days? Oh, that's another good question. We are not yet open to the public. Um, we will be opening when um, the Notre Dame students come back to campus. So I believe our open date is tentatively August 13th. I think so. Somewhere um, there. So just after the students' classes start, we'll reopen. Um, but again, everything is subject to change depending on what's going on um, in the world. But definitely keep an eye on our website, our social media. We've been posting a lot to Facebook and Instagram. Um, with ways that families can engage with our works, um, even from a distance. We all missed being in the museum, being with everyone um, and interacting with the art, but we're trying to do a lot of that virtually right now. And well, the Sculpture Park is always open. Oh yeah, Sculpture Park always open. Come, come out here, enjoy nature and the artwork and the beautiful weather. Well, thank you uh, both very much uh, for being with us today. Um, I just want to remind those, especially if you're watching this uh, after the fact, on our website, there is a link for evaluation so we can see how the online version is going, um, give us some feedback, and we have an undergraduate student who's doing research on that evaluation project as well. Um, so hopefully uh, you will be able to join us on Monday or Thursday or Saturday of next week. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Kilburn. Thank you, families. Bye.